that week. Um, we're going to have a handful of lessons on uh, the smaller book that we gave you, Gender Ideology, uh, I believe is the name of it. And uh, we'll have, I think, three or four lessons on that before we take a break for Christmas. All right, so uh, this morning we're looking at, uh, like I said, we're combining lessons seven and eight. And the question is, how does the church approach the LBGTQ plus revolution? So the first question that we're looking to answer this morning um, is really where we're looking at in 1 John. says, after reading chapter 9 and appendix 3, this is in the de Young book, uh, write out a brief sketch of what you see as biblical truths on this matter that the church must uphold to be faithful to God, His Word, and our community around us. So 1 John chapter 1 <clears throat> is where we'll be looking first. 1 John uh, 1, look at verse 5. It says this, This is the message that we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, uh, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice where it says in verse 5, God is light. I want you to notice that and highlight that. Now, go over to 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verses 7 and eight. All right, it says here is John really begins to expound on this this great truth of the love that the 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 church has for itself and believers have for one another. Where it says, uh, verse seven, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Notice that phrase, God is love. Now, I think it's important for us to um, answer this question on how do we approach this topic by, by, number one, holding these two attributes of God together that are not contradictory. Um, in verse... 5, back in chapter 1, it says God is light. And specifically what that's talking about when it says God is light is God is holy. And we talked about that at length uh, last week. We'll, we'll kind of brush up on that in just a second. Then it says God is love. Now, while these two attributes of God, characteristics of, of who He is, maybe it sounds simple for us to explain them, but actually as I begin to read a little bit more of some theologians and what they're, uh, how they're trying to help us understand these things, they're, they are a little more difficult than just um, what you might think. So let's, let's look at these two attributes specifically of God as we think about how we are to approach this topic, all right? Um, so the first thing we need to look at is the love of God, all right? One of the words for love, there's uh, two main words for love in the Bible in Greek. One is phileo, uh, which has the meaning of brotherly love, like you have the city of Philadelphia, which is, in essence, what that means. Um, then you have the word agape. They're, they're used interchangeably. Uh, sometimes preachers make a big deal about the differences there, but uh, recent studies have shown it's not that different. But the idea of the word agape means to have a warm regard for uh, an interest in another. It can be uh, translated as cherish, have affection for, or uh, to love. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 8 and verse 16 says, God is love. God is love. Now, one thing people uh, try to make a strong point on that are talking about this is that does not mean that love is God, but rather that God is love. Uh, one person says it like this, God is love does not equal love is God, a form of pantheistic thinking, any more than uh, grass is green means that green is grass. Love does not define God, but God does define love, all right? So it's important for us to understand that. Now, uh, 
One thing that you'll note as you go throughout Scripture, the clearest explanation that we have of the love of God is the cross. I mean, John 3, 16. For God, what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here's a couple of quotes for you. Uh, Gerald Bray on his Doctrine of God says this, In the Scriptures, the love of God comes to us above all as the promise and assurance of salvation. Now, we talked about God's love a few Sundays ago when we were in Romans 1, uh, where it says that, that the church is the beloved of God. And we tried to make the distinction there that, that, yes, there is a general concern that God has for all people. There is a general universal love and compassion that God has for all people. He certainly desires the flourishing of all humanity. And yet we distinguish the love that God has for his people. There is a distinct difference in the way that God loves and we see that clearly in the cross of Christ. That is the clearest expression of love that we have in the Bible and how God gave his only son up for us that we might be saved. All right. Here's a quote from J.I. Packer in his uh, classic book, Knowing God. It says, God's love is an exercise of his goodness towards individual sinners, whereby, having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. So the emphasis that, that I saw time and time again as we were going throughout uh, these different theologians is the emphasis on God's love expressed in the cross. I already read 1 John 4, 7 and 8, but notice again the last phrase in verse 8 is that God is love. All right, now how are we to express this? Well, we see a couple of different illustrations of how uh, we are now to love. If, you, if we back up to verse 7 for just a minute, before you get to uh, John saying that God is love, what does he say? Beloved, let us love one another. So the emphasis really of 1 John 4 is how we as Christians are to love one another. And the reason that we are to love one another is because God is love. And God has placed love within our hearts by His Holy Spirit and given us a natural affinity for one another, a natural care and concern for each other. So the idea here that we're trying to get at is because God is love and because we are His children, we now are to express that same characteristic that God expresses to us. And even when you look at examples throughout Scripture... Um, you see uh, people that, that not only loved people in the church that were a little more lovely, but you see an emphasis on loving um, even your enemies. You see the emphasis in uh, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the first martyr of the church who was a deacon in Jerusalem, and as he preached the gospel, uh, the Jewish community was so furious at him that they took him out of the uh, they took him out of the town and they, they pelted his body with rocks until he died. And he looked up into the heavens and he saw Jesus. And he did not have any anger, any angst against those who were pelting the stones off of his body. Where did he get that from? It's the love of God that was put in his heart. Jesus even says that we are not just to love one another, but we're to even love our enemies the people who don't love us, the people who don't like us, we're to love them as well. And then we see, uh, obviously, in the cross when Jesus, the first thing that's uttered from his lips, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So here is really a brief, brief summary of the love of God. Now let's look at the holiness of God. We looked at this passage in uh, 1 John uh, one, which, which really expresses the holiness of God. We tried to define the holiness of God last week, and um, it's a little harder to define than you might think it is. And I was watching, I actually saw a reel this morning from R.C. Sproul uh, talking about the holiness of God, and he makes the point that there's only 
one attribute of God that we find given in triplets in Scripture, where it says God is this, this, this. What is that? Yeah, you see that in Isaiah when the angels are surrounding God. In Isaiah 6, they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. You see in Revelation 4, the same emphasis where he is called the thrice holy God. Uh, for God to be holy means that he has an intrinsic purity and separation from sin. So if all we were to do is look at this aspect of love, we may be tempted to yield to this sense of indulgence. And even one of the chapters, or I think maybe one of the appendix, uh, appendices of, of De Young's book is, my God is a God of love, as if that's all that God is. And while he certainly does have a love for all people and a desire for human flourishing, that cannot compromise the holiness of God. That God does have a desire for his people, how they are to behave, and a, a general ban on certain relationships. And same-sex relationships is certainly in uh, that, that realm of things that God has clearly banned and says is, is not allowed. All right, So love of God, holiness of God, they're not contradictory, but they are expressions of his character and who he is. All right, So that's question number one. My computer has died up here, so just, just so you know. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at question two in just a second. Does anybody have any questions on that or, or thoughts? All right, good. All right, let's look at question two then. I'll be navigating in the dark a little bit. Uh, question two deals with the topic of repentance. So coming out of the topic of the love of God and the holiness of God, when we understand God is holy and we look at ourselves, what do we see in us? Unholiness, right? Uh, we see that he is something that we are not, which leads us to the response that the gospel calls for. And what is the response that we are called to give to the message of the gospel? Faith and repentance, that we are to believe the gospel, that Jesus died uh, for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and that we are to repent. Now, I don't know about you and church context that you grew up in. I, to be honest, never heard repentance ever being preached. It was just uh, believe or ask Jesus into your heart, and that was kind of the, 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 the wolf of the message. Uh, that was it. But repentance is essential in our responding to the gospel and what God has called for. So what is repentance? Well, uh, there's a, a handful of pages into the young book that he, he really calls us out. And get, so, ask the question here on pages 98 to 100, he lays out a brief overview of the doctrine of repentance. Explain what you understand repentance is and is not. All right, before we get into that, does anybody want to just take a wild shot in the dark here? What is repentance and what is repentance not? Yeah, goodness of God leads us to repentance. Yeah, gift of God, what was your first thing you said? 
Continual. Yeah, so it's not, it doesn't mean that, that repentance leads us to perfection, which in essence means a lifelong disposition of repentance that we must express toward our sin because even as believers we still sin. Uh, yeah, anything else on repentance, what it is, what it is not? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, everything in, in, in the Christian life is an, an aspect of repentance. Yeah, exactly. Um, is, is, yeah. Yes, it's not lip service, um, which um, is is remorse, is simple remorse repentance, feeling bad. Well, not really. Um, if you if you ever had a dog chew up something they knew they shouldn't have, I mean, they look at you with a bit of remorse when you're mad at them, right? But they don't know how to repent. <laughs> um, and we, f we regularly express remorse for the things that we have done. But, the, but uh, 2 Corinthians 7 talks about what is called a worldly repentance. And that's in essence what it is. It feels bad that we've done something. So um, we've been in our, uh, we, as we've been going through Genesis in the morning service with the prayer uh, of repentance and confession, we've been looking at the story of Esau and Jacob and all of that. And it even talks about Esau having a disposition of tears that he had sold his birthright and his blessing away. But he was not repentant. So remorse does not mean repentance. In essence, repentance, it certainly involves remorse and a feeling of guilt. But in essence, repentance is a turning from our sins. All right? So let's look at a couple of things here on this aspect of repentance, which is what the gospel calls for. Um, and yes, this is a picture of Joel Osteen's church. Um, why do I put this up here? Because unfortunately, modern, modern day Christianity is doing everything that they can to try to minimize the offense of the gospel to the point where it's almost like we're going to minimize the preaching of sin to where we can maybe just sneak up on people. And hopefully, after they come to our church a million times, something's just going to click within them. And they're going to say, wow, I just it's been so amazing being around you sinners that know Jesus, and we're going to love Jesus like you now. Um, and yet, what you find Jesus doing in his ministry and his preaching is the exact opposite. <laughs> He is very clear in preaching on sin and the need of repentance to enter the kingdom of God. And I'm certainly not trying to throw stones at uh, anybody in particular, but this is something that we must be aware of, is that this is modern-day evangelical Christianity. Let's slimline it as much as possible, and let's not preach on repentance or the need to turn from sin. All right? All right, so what does the word repent mean? The verb repent is metanoia. It means to change one's mind, to feel remorse, or even to be converted, um, according to the, the top lexicon that uh, is out there today for Greek. Now, I listed the people here that are preaching repentance in the New Testament. So the first person you find preaching in the New Testament is who? John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, I've always liked the idea of John the Baptist eating grasshoppers and wearing, you know, uh, kind of the, the leather Tarzan look and having a grasshopper hanging out of his mouth. He just seemed like a real wild man. But what was his message? It was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, turn from your sin. Jesus is coming. You need to be ready. 
And then when Jesus begins preaching in his ministry, what does he say? The exact same thing. So in chapter 3, you've got an introduction to John, and he's saying repent. And then you come to Jesus, and Jesus is saying repent. And then Jesus dies, buried, rose again, ascends to heaven. The Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, and Peter begins to preach. And what is his message? It's repent. And then you've got Paul, and what Paul preaches in Acts chapter 20. What does he say? Repent. Uh, toward God, repentance toward God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. So what is the clear emphasis of New Testament preaching? Repentance is essential to be a Christian. And here's a few things that DeYoung lists about this, uh, about what repentance would involve, okay? He, he lists three things, and I imagine there's more that we could uh, have here, but we must change our mind about the following thing. We must change our minds about ourselves. What does culture normally tell us? Uh, you're a good person. I just threw up a picture of Joel Osteen a minute ago, and I, I saw an interview of him uh, years ago. I think he was on CNN, uh, Larry King, and uh, he said people are essentially good in their nature. They just, they just do some bad things. Friends, that is the total opposite of what the Bible says. And as we're going to be looking at Romans 1 today, and I would appreciate your prayers as it is a, a very heavy passage of Scripture, um, one of the things that we're going to draw out from that is we are connected to our sin. It is who we are. We at times say, well, I didn't mean that, I, 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 that's really not who I am. But the description of Scripture is that we sin because that is who we are. We do what we do out of the lust of our heart, out of the desires that we have from our impurity. So we must repent that, uh, and, and change our mind in understanding we're not essentially good. We are sinners. All right, a second thing DeYoung says here, not only do we need to understand we're not good, but we need to be sorry and responsible for our actions. Um, no question, there are things that happen in our lives that shape our thinking, right? It's the whole nurture-nature conversation. Why do people what they do? Is it nurture or is it nature? Certainly, there are things that come into our life very early, that may set us on a bad trajectory. Maybe we're sinned against, and it puts us on a bad path. But at the end of the day, we are responsible for the choices that we make. And we, we must not blame other people for what has happened in our lives. And then also we must uh, change our minds about God. That He is King, and He is in charge, and He is one to be trusted. Okay, All right, any questions or, or thoughts on any of that on the subject of repentance? All right, so let's look at question three now. And uh, on pages 100 through 102, and evaluate how Paul taught the church of Corinth to deal with sin. There's no question that our modern culture would think this is unloving, do you think this is an unloving disposition to have and why? Well, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know the, the most, uh, how do we say it nicely? The most dysfunctional church <laughs> that, that is in the New Testament is the church in Corinth. I mean, it had so many problems. Right out of the gate, Paul starts talking to them about how they're divided and they're split on, well, this person's my favorite preacher, and I only listen to this person, and they're divided about who's the best. They had all this infighting going on. Uh, they were suing each other and taking each other to court. Instead of just trying to reconcile their differences with each other, like Christian people should do. Uh, what are some other issues they had? The, the, the rich in the church were not taking care of the poor, and they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Look, you don't have to be a rocket scientist and a theologian to understand getting drunk at the Lord's Supper is not a good idea, okay? But, but maybe above all, 
the worst thing that we see going on in the church of Corinth was their disposition towards sinning members. They had members in the church that were in sin that Paul even says the Gentiles, the pagans would not even put up with this and you are flaunting this as if it is a good thing. And yet, Paul says very clearly, this is not the way you are supposed to be doing. So that's laid out in 1 Corinthians 5. We won't turn there for sake of time. But it is an important passage for you to have kind of uh, stuck in your mind when it comes to this aspect of how the church is to deal with sin. And uh, the sin that specifically is in question is a man who was having a uh, basically having an affair with his father's wife and obviously it was his stepmother and not his mother but it was something that was ongoing and people in the church didn't seem to have any issue with it Paul is very explicit in the language that he gives to that church um let me, before we get into what he says, here's, here's something by DeYoung that I think is very helpful for us. He says this on page 100, the Bible's teaching on this matter is as clear as it is unpopular. Persistent, unrepentant sexual sin leads people to hell. When the man in Corinth was found sleeping with his father's wife, Paul's response was not, we all make mistakes. Or, thank God for his unconditional love. That's countercultural, isn't it? That's really counter church cultural in the way that sin is handled in the life of the church. Uh, this is what Paul says, and this is all from De Young. Verse 2, he says, You need to mourn over that sin. This is something that needs to be mourned over, not celebrated. Verse 5, he says, Deliver that man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Verse 9, no longer associate with the immoral man. Uh, verse 13, purge the evil person from among you. So in essence, what, what Paul is saying there in 1 Corinthians 5 is this is a heavy matter that calls for remorse, repentance, and excommunication it is not something that needs to be swept under the rug. It is something that must be dealt with, and it must be dealt with swiftly. All right? Um, so here's a question for you. Why is this approach towards sin not unloving? So culture would say, man, that's not very loving. Even church culture, right? I mean, I, I've heard of... Um, you know, one of the one of the guys that was kind of a a, a big a big deal in the uh, movement that we were in for a long time was asked questions like that about sexual sin and said, "Well, you got members in your church like that? Do you do you confront them?" And his response basically was, "No, just let them keep coming to church and trust that God works in their heart." Um, why do you think, which is the opposite of what Paul just said, right? <laughs> I mean, clearly that's the opposite of what Paul just said in 1 Corinthians 5. Why do you think the approach that Paul is taking is not an unloving one? Why is it a loving approach? Yeah. 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 So church wide and then individually. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Yeah, anytime you see a mixing of idolatry, you always see a compromise. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Good thoughts. Anybody else? All right. Yeah. I I really don't have anything to add. Um, I think that's spot on. You know, you um, we can't we cannot try to give people an affirmation when God is not affirming them, and to do that is the most unloving thing that we can possibly do. Because it's not a, a debate on what you know Bible version is best or something like that. You're, you're literally consigning somebody to hell when they think that they are in a good standing before God. This is heavy stuff for sure. All right, so um, let's look at question four. And we're not going to get through everything, I don't think. But uh, question four is on what do we do with the argument that God has made me this way. So um, this is pretty much the popular estimation in our culture. And, and I want to say, parents, if there's ever been a time for us to not only help filter what our kids are seeing from the world, but try to help them process even what is being taught in movies and stuff like that. So, you know, the Frozen deal came out years ago, and, and I mean, that was kind of before, I mean, what was that, like eight years ago or something? I don't know. But, I mean, that was like before everything kind of exploded. And, you know, most of us heard that for the first time, or like, let it go. It was like, oh, yeah, let's let it go. But that, that's not the message that, that uh, this chick is saying. <laughs> She's basically just saying, hey, be your own person. Whatever your heart tells you to do is what you need to do. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And when people say, follow your heart, folks, that is the worst possible thing that anybody could ever do. And, and, and here's the reason why. Uh, two verses come to mind. Romans 5.12 talks about how um, sin ultimately comes from one person. Who is that one person? It's Adam. So we are all, as a, a human race, dead in sin. We have what's called original sin, meaning that we have thorough corruption within us, and the way that we see the world is through a sinful lens. We desire sinful things. That comes directly from our first parents. So... Yeah, following your heart is not a good idea. And then add to that Jeremiah 17, 9, that says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The things that even feel good to us and the things that even feel right to us, if they are contrary to the Word of God and what God says, then we do those things to our own destruction and our own demise. So this argument certainly does not hold up. Um, here's something by DeYoung talking about the whole God has made me, uh, quote, made me this way. Uh, the claim that homosexuality can be tied to fixed hereditary or biological trait cannot be supported by the scientific evidence. Even if biology causes, uh, causes for homosexuality, could be isolated, and even if the desires almost always come unbidden, these factors do not remove culpability from the equation. We are all products of nature and nurture. 
Um, if you haven't read the book, and I understand that some of the content in the book is somewhat heavy, but if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read at least pages 110, 111, and 112. That is um, some of the best content in the book in talking about this aspect in particular. There's a lot to unpack there. But in essence, he's saying, look, we're all products to an extent of nurture and nature, how we are brought up, how we were born. Certain people um, just have certain bends in a certain way sinfully. Other people don't. And it's very unwise for us to look at people who are bent in a certain way, either by nurture or nature, and to look at them and judge them and say, you know what, well, I don't struggle with that. I'm better than you are. Well, they may have things that they don't struggle with that we do. We're all uniquely broken. We're all uniquely sinful. We all have those struggles. But DeYoung's point is, even if science could prove that people are born a certain way with a sinful expression toward perversion, um, even if that is the case, that does not remove the culpability. That does not remove the responsibility that all people have um, in their relationship before God. I think he's clearly right on that, either way. Any thoughts, uh, questions, comments on that? All right, uh, let's move on to question five then. We'll just answer this one quickly. I'll let you pitch this out. So uh, read pages 111, 112, Jeremiah 17, uh, 9. Can the I desire this so it must be okay logic be held consistently and why? So that's, that's the, the popular disposition, right? Well, I, I desire this. Um, even 30, 40, 50 years ago, psychiatric clinics, if somebody came in and they said, well, I feel this way, um, or talking about gender dysphoria, um, it'd be handled much differently then than it is now. Even uh, homosexuality 50 years ago, was viewed as deviant behavior. And psychiatrists, psychologists would try to counsel people out of that. So is it possible to hold this, this idea consistently down the board? That as long as you feel it and desire it, it's okay. Where does that logic break down? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, it certainly can't be held consistently because even the world would look at some things and say, this is not acceptable. Even if a person desires it um, yeah anything else yeah okay Yeah. Yeah. I think that is probably a good question for Brady in a couple of weeks, um, as he probably has more experience dealing with that than I would. But I think um, one thing you could do is go to the, begin with nature and work your way to the gospel. I mean, there are times that Paul even does that in his evangelistic ministry where. Um, he begins with the broadest type of knowledge of God that all people can understand. And we talked about that last week in, the, in uh, Romans 1, because all people know that there is a God. And all people, even though they suppress that knowledge and they reject that knowledge, 
there are some things about God and nature that they know. And the reality of nature would show us that men are not naturally to be with men and women are not naturally to be with women. Men and women naturally, biologically, go together. So I think that would be a good avenue to begin in starting off on the broadest um, ring of the knowledge of God and, and, and bring that closer because the Christian worldview is consistent from beginning to end and all truth is ultimately God's truth. So does that make sense? Yeah, that's a very good question. All right, anything else? All right, uh, one last thing. How should we, and this, this probably could be a lesson in and of itself. So we've talked heavily about repentance and how, um, you know, excommunication for sinful activity. But now how does a church come alongside people who are struggling with same-sex attraction? Um, reality is, uh, I forget the statistics. I, I, if somebody knows them, let me know. But I, I, I heard a statistic the other day about the current generation like I've always heard growing up that like three percent of um, three percent of the of the population would identify as homosexual or gay or something like that. But I think this generation that's coming up, there's like ten percent. Am I right on that? Does anybody know that, or is it is it more than that? I can't I can't really remember, but it seems like that's something I'd I'd heard. Higher than that, fifteen percent. Yeah. So that means that in our own community, 15 out of 100 kids, if that stat is right, 15 out of 100 kids are going to struggle with same-sex attraction, gender dysphoria, something like that. This is not something that the church can just simply duck on. This is not something that we can just hide our heads in the sand and think, well, this is in our nice little holy community here. We're not going to ever think about this. We're not going to ever deal with this. Reality is, is, is we will have people that will be a part of our church, possibly, that, that struggle with that. So what are we supposed to do with that? I understand this is something that um, many of us look at and we think, Ugh, how, do, how do we navigate through this? We do need to remember that the church is a hospital for repentant sinners. We have to remember that, no matter what the sin is. Um, so... DeYoung gives a few things here I think, I think are good, and we'll close it with this. Uh, how does the church help? Number one is a reminder of the call to self-denial. You know, what does Jesus say when he, when he says, follow me? What is his call? Forsake all and follow me. What would that include? Yeah, our sinful desires. And that's for all of us that we must flee our sinful desires to pursue Christ. So we need that reminder. Uh, community and openness. People um, that are seeking repentance and a relationship with God, if there is a struggle there, they need community. They, they, they need people in their life that they can talk to. Certainly that is something that we need to develop as a church, is just community in our own struggle with sin and uh, the, the, the need of one another to help overcome that. And then the removal of the idolatry of the family. He gives a really good quote here. Um, he says, the trajectory of the New Testament is to relativize the importance of marriage and biological kinship. A spouse and a minivan full of kids on the way to Disney World is a sweet gift and a terrible God. Well, that was a really good quote, how we can at times make an idol out of the family. And we need to be very, very careful about that. And then he gives the example of Jesus and how Jesus lived a full human life and was not married, didn't have any children, um, never had a physical relationship in that way, but lived a full humanity. Yeah, heavy stuff for sure. Anybody have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah.
Yeah. Jurisdiction of the church. Um, you know, there's no specific way to give a blanket um, answer to every single scenario. Um, but I think the, the line has to be drawn even for visitors if um, there's a flaunting of sin. No, you know, no matter what that would be, but certainly in the cases of gender and homosexuality, if there was a, a flaunting of that, um, like I heard recently of a church in Culpeper that um, a man was transitioning to a woman, and um, he and his wife came to church every Sunday, and he was like wearing heels and a dress and stuff like that and they sat on the front row um, those are scenarios that 30 years ago we never had to think about we do have to think about that now when it becomes a point of flaunting and it's obvious that it's flaunting I think that that's the line of distinction where stiff rebuke and you can't excommunicate them, but you would, um, something like that, I would venture to say, that would be a means of, you cannot continue to come if you are seeking to flaunt your sin in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Good thoughts. Certainly a heavy conversation. Um anything else before we we go? We're only 15 minutes over. Um, <laughs> all right, very good. Well, thank you all so much, and I, I appreciate your engagement this morning. Some sin is just easier to wear than others, too, right? <laughs> <laughs>